Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called, Exceptional Extraterrestrial Encounters, 10 True Cases. So what makes these cases exceptional? Well, several things, I think. They all involve humanoids. They're all, for the most part, except perhaps one, quite extensive encounters with a lot of interaction between UFOs and the witnesses. Most of them, all but two, involve multiple witnesses. Over half of them involve some pretty compelling physical evidence, a wide variety of evidence actually, the same kind we often hear in UFO cases. And by that I mean landing traces, electromagnetic effects, physiological or medical effects, animal reactions, these sort of things, which is important because this gives additional credibility to each case. Some of these involve really high caliber witnesses, police officers, nurses, this sort of thing. These cases have occurred all over the world. I love covering cases from across the planet because this shows that ETs show no discrimination in who they visit. They're visiting all over the planet. In fact, I think each location on this planet probably has a long and rich history of UFO encounters if you dig hard enough. Also, these cases are taking place over a period of decades in this collection of 10 encounters. They begin in the 1960s all the way up to the 2000s, so that's quite a stretch of time. And what I also like about these cases is we see a wide variety of humanoid types. All humanoid, pretty much very much like us, more alike us than different, I think. But yeah, many different types of humanoids, certainly not just greys. And these cases are somewhat unusual. I think each of them have something to contribute to our understanding of extraterrestrial visitations which is why I included them in this list. So a lot of cases, let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about, I call, It's Not Human. Of course, this is a direct quote from the main witness. This case took place in Kolmarden, Sweden, actually, on August 23rd, 1967. I like this case for a number of reasons. It's got multiple witnesses. As I said, it's quite extensive. It actually took place over a period of days and some really interesting and unusual physical evidence, not to mention a very unusual looking ET who is holding a very unusual instrument in his hands. This case comes from researcher Sven Schallen from Sweden. It involves two 15 year old teenagers, a boy and a girl who were boy and girlfriend uh, their names are Eric and Inga, though I believe these might be pseudonyms. But it was around 8 p.m., again on August 23, 1967, when Eric and Inga were walking on a small road near an industrial lot not far from their homes in Colmarden, when they saw a red glowing object drop from the sky and actually land near the edge of the woods. Now, this, this object was too bright to really make out a shape. They did notice it was totally silent. And realizing that it was quite strange, they fled, actually getting off the road and taking a shortcut towards their home. And they were nearly home and decided to go back on the road. At this point, they saw the object again. They could see it moving back and forth over the nearby woods. Now they were walking by a little cabin and as they approached it they saw that it was empty and padlocked but inside through a window they saw unusual yellow lights floating around inside and at the same time they saw this weird cone of light kind of rising up from the ground and also heard weird noises which they described as quote short silent thumps on a plank. So this was starting to get them a little bit frightened because meanwhile this glowing red object reappeared and now changed to white, moved over a nearby cornfield and landed. 
this point, they both got a very creepy sensation and felt like somebody or something was watching them. And so they ran home. Turned out nobody was home at the time. So they went next door to where their sisters lived. But as soon as they arrived, before they even got inside, a shining object dropped down from the sky and actually hung in the air in front of them, about 10 feet in front of them, and only 13 feet high. They said it was round and had a very bright light in the center, very bright like an electrical torch. So, as soon as that object appeared, they heard this high-pitched, loud and piercing whistling noise coming from a nearby brook. At the same time, they heard footsteps. And this was when they turned and saw a strange humanoid, which made this huge leaping jump out of the bushes next to the house. And in fact, Eric said that this humanoid looked like it was actually flying. And it came to a landing and stopped about 34 feet away. And boy, was it weird looking. This humanoid, they said, was just over four feet tall, quite short. It wore dark, skin-tight clothing. They couldn't really see its face at this point as it was bent forward and down. And the girl, thinking this might be a friend, actually walked towards the figure. But then the figure raised its head and arms, moving with this weird, sort of jerky, unsteady, trembling movements. But at the same time, they got a sense that it had a lot of strength. And this is when they both got a really good look at it. They said its head was disproportionately large, far too large for its body, and was covered by something dark. They couldn't say whether this was hair or some kind of hood, but whatever was on its head kind of went down over the forehead, sort of with a V between the eyes, much like a widow's peak. They did see that it had huge dark eyes, which seemed to penetrate them. It was looking right at them at this point. They said it looked human-ish, except where its eyes and nose were, all they saw was kind of an X. They said its arms and legs were really quite thin, and its legs looked bow-legged, short little legs, And they said, again, it seemed to be wearing dark coveralls with a belt around the waist. But around its ankles, they saw cables or tubes or wires, something that shone with an intensely bright white light. And so at this point, Eric shouted out, Look out! It's not human! And he grabbed Inga and pulled her back. And this is when they saw that this figure was actually holding a very strange instrument in its hands. They said this instrument looked kind of like a short tube, but it had a box shape at the rear end, and judging from the way this being held it with both his hands, this object was very heavy. They thought it might be a weapon, because they could see this gleaming, quote, arc of light along next to the tube section, and they became frightened because this figure was pointing this tool right at them. So at this point, they fled to the house, rushed inside. The girl's sisters and other family members confirmed that the teenagers were very badly shook up, frightened. And they tried to calm them down. The teenagers explained what happened. They had a really difficult time doing that because this encounter really traumatized them. But apparently it wasn't over yet. Because a few days later, they did find some very interesting physical evidence directly related to this encounter. There were some apple trees at the location of the humanoid encounter. They found some apples that were strangely split in half, apparently not by a knife. One half of an apple had small, evenly spaced crescent marks. The other was covered with this strange smelling slime. Now, they also found small three-toed footprints in the area, which were about six inches long, and also out in the field where the craft had landed, and other strange marks, perhaps from the tool itself. But more events were in progress. It was about two days following the encounter that a sister of the girl says that she saw a very bright light shining into the house at night and heard steps kind of like you know, footsteps outside the house and other noises. 
and in the morning they heard, found that two shutters on the house had been broken loose from the windows. So hard to relate that directly to the prior encounter, but they thought it was strange. And yeah, again, the children were so frightened by the experience, they had difficulty relating the details to not only the, their family, but the investigators as well. And their family said they were in shock for days following this incident and actually refused to go outside at night. What a strange case. I think it's so interesting how profoundly the witnesses are affected. One of the really interesting things in this case, again, is that weird instrument the E.T. was holding. Also, how it was apparently there for the apple orchard. Hard to say for sure, but considering that some of the physical evidence did affect the apples themselves, it certainly shows that the E.T. was interested in the apples. I will say that there is a large zoo nearby, a wilderness preserve, so that could be a factor here. There's no direct evidence of that but I think it's worth knowing. A really interesting case. And here's the next one I'd like to talk about. I call this one Alien Car Mechanic. I can't prove that that's why the ETs were here, but they certainly did seem to be interested in the main witness's car. This is one of the few cases in this collection which does involve a single witness, but it's an important case because as we shall see, it involves some really profound electromagnetic effects, as well as some physical evidence in terms of landing traces. And the ETs were not only unusual looking, they behaved in very unusual ways. The witness in this case is known only as Mr. N.N. Those are his initials. He wants to be anonymous. And it was about 3 a.m. on April 27, 1969, in Slagesel, Denmark, when he was driving between the towns of Slagesel and Neistved. And he was about nine miles south of Slagels and had just driven past a very famous landmark. It's called the Gilden Home Manor House, pictured here. So he's just driving past that and the woods surrounding this very well-known manor house when he had a strange feeling of being watched. And this is when he immediately noticed a brilliant white circular object, which was quite off in the distance, but immediately zoomed towards his car in the space of about three or four seconds. Next thing he knows, it stops right next to him. The engine of his car promptly shut off. The headlights went out. He just managed to pull over to the side of the road but this object was now less than 20 feet away from him, ahead of him on the road. And this is the exact spot. And he saw instantly at this point that it was a, quote, flying saucer. He estimated that it was about 27 feet wide, 18 feet high. And he described it as looking like two bowls placed end to end with sort of a flat section around the perimeter, a band. And on top of this was a small dome with a bright stripe around it. He said the bottom bowl section had three glowing portholes. The craft itself looked metallic, was sort of gray-green in color. And he said it was hovering about nine feet above the ground. And as he watched, three landing legs slid out from underneath towards the ground. And as they touched the ground, as this object actually landed, a wide cylindrical tube came down from the very center of the bottom of the object. An opening appeared in this tube and out stepped four small entities, one after the other, and all of them began to move towards his car. Now, Mr. N.N. said that he felt no fear at this point, and he had actually been thinking of leaving his car to investigate more closely, but seeing these little men coming towards him, he decided it was more prudent to stay inside the car. And as he watched, these little men moved towards his car with movements that he described as slow and graceful, kind of reminding him of divers walking on the bottom of the ocean. He said they were all dressed identically in shiny green overalls, each of which had three dark vertical stripes on the center of their chests. 
the center stripe was a little bit longer than the two on either side. But two of these little men were carrying what looked to him like long, slender lanterns. So these were quite short figures, each about three feet tall. He could see their faces. He said they looked largely human, but their features were sort of flattened against their face. And he could see their mouths moving, but heard no voices. What he did hear was a loud, humming, sort of electrical sound. So he's watching all of this with absolute amazement when a long, thick cable slid out of the lower part of the object and moved towards his car. And it stopped, he said, about six feet from his car, but close enough for him to see that this cable had a weird sort of square screen with a round, glowing white lens fixed to the end of it, the end that was kind of closest to his car. So it looks like it's some sort of examination device. Hard to say for sure. But these four beings next walked towards his car and surrounded it. And the two that were carrying these lantern-like devices moved to the left side of his car and placed these devices at various spots on the car itself, apparently inspecting his car. So after doing this for just a few moments, the four little guys returned to the underside of the craft, entered the cylinder, which retracted along with the cable and then the landing legs. The craft then moved quickly upwards and disappeared to the southwest. So afterwards, the main witness's car, Mr. NN, started right back up. The headlights came back on and he noticed that his watch would appar had apparently stopped now was running again, but was exactly four minutes slow, which apparently indicated that this entire event lasted four minutes. So now that this craft was gone, he got out of his car. He immediately smelled a strange odor, which was not described, but he did see three holes on the ground, which he said were hot. And later, in an inspection of the area where this craft landed showed that the vegetation was very slow to grow. So different types of landing traces. For me, one of the takeaways from that case is if you're driving on a remote highway late at night, be prepared for a UFO encounter because there does seem to be a lot of cases that fit that category. It's certainly an interesting case on a number of levels considering the weird electromagnetic effects and the landing traces as well. And we move on to the next case, which I call UFOs Invade Iowa Farm. This occurred over a period of years, actually, 1969, 1970. Probably more than that, but at least that. This is in Clayton County, Iowa, a pretty remote farmhouse area, lots of woods, uh, streams, fields. UFOs do seem to be attracted to farms. That's one of the things I like about this case. But what's super interesting about this case is it has some really extraordinary landing trace evidence. And it's a complicated series of events, of course, involving multiple witnesses and humanoids as well. This case came very close to not being known at all, uh, but was investigated by a professional researcher, Mr. Glenn McWain, and again involves multiple witnesses and a complicated series of events surrounding a rural Iowa farmhouse. Now the case first came to Glenn's attention when an electrical lineman reported that he found a series of burnt circles on the ground not far from the power lines near this particular farmhouse. So Glenn McWain inspected these circles and then contacted the owner of the farm, a Mr. S.H., and found out that he was a former military officer who worked with missiles, now a farmer. And this farmer said that, yes, quote, odd things had been occurring around the farmhouse since 1969 up through 1970. Uh, his family and several of their neighbors kept seeing these glowing red objects streaking across the sky and stopping on a dime and coming in for a landing, sometimes in the forest, 
sometimes in the fields in the area, and sometimes directly in their own cornfields or whatever crop they were growing. And in fact, it was in early spring of 1969 when Mr. S.H.'s children were outside, they saw a spherical red object hovering over the power lines not far from their barn and livestock pens. So one of the boys hid behind the corner of the barn and watched from that perspective, while another of the boys climbed a tree to get a clearer look. And while they watched, this object, which wasn't that far away, actually emitted a red beam of light, striking first one boy and then the other. Now, one of the boys fled in fear, while the other watched this object rise up, move along the power lines, and land behind a nearby grove of trees. Uh, he told his father, and the next day they went there and found a circular burn spot and impressions in the soil. So that's just one event. I mean, this kept occurring over the next two years, over and over again. These objects would appear very low level, usually bright red, and land, leaving these big circular burn marks. Strangely, the UFOs almost always landed near the farm after about 5 p.m. They would always appear at a very low elevation and then would lower themselves to the ground. And before long, there were literally dozens of these burned circles in the area all around this one particular farm. So the researcher, Glenn McWayne, again went to this farm and observed the circles himself. And as he says in his own words, and I quote, I certainly had an eerie feeling as I walked among dozens of burned circular areas on this farm. It is almost as if some alien air force might be using this farm as an informal landing base. In my opinion, if a mysterious someone did not want to be observed by a lot of people, the area in which the SH farm is located would be a perfect spot to conduct secret activities. It is a heavily wooded area, and a river runs through the farm. There is also a large cave in the area. So, Glenn interviewed the whole family, and he learned that the boys had not only seen the UFOs, they had seen the actual UFO occupants on a number of occasions, and on one occasion had a very close encounter with them. One of the boys was watching as this glowing red spherical craft landed in the pasture near the barn, and he hid in the barn and watched it. And this little humanoid came right out. And according to the boy, this euphonaut was quite short, about three feet tall. And I'll just quote the witness directly, as he told Glenn McWayne, and again I quote, He was dressed from head to toe in a white spacesuit. It looked a lot like the suits our astronauts wear. He was just wearing this tight-fitting white suit that covered his hands and feet, as well as his body, and of course he wore a helmet. It was yellowish-brown colored, and it seemed too big for his little body. His arms were awfully long. They hung past his knees. So, this witness did make a point of saying that the head was quite large, and per said that to Glenn, the investigator, Perhaps his head is so large because he has all those brains which he would need to be able to come from another planet. I thought that was a kind of a cute observation. But the witness did say that this E.T.'s hands looked normal. He said the feet were different. Instead of boots, the E.T. was walking on what looked to him like two prongs. But then he watched as something really amazing happened. And again, I will just let the witness describe in his own words what he saw. As he says, The wildest thing was, when he took off his helmet and looked at me, his head was a light, real pale green, and his head was completely bald, no hair at all. His eyes were real big, but his nose and mouth were nothing but little slits. He didn't really have any kind of expression at all, just blank. He wiped his forehead with the back of his hand, you know, like someone who has been working hard and sweating. Then he got back into the shiny ball, I suppose it was a flying saucer, and it took off. 
So that's just one of several humanoid encounters this family had. And again, the encounters became so numerous that at some point the family became somewhat used to them. It was kind of their new normal, and they just learned to live with it. There's a lot to learn from that case, I think. Once again, we see ETs being very attracted to farmhouses. I love this case because the family had so many encounters, they actually got used to it and kind of took it in stride. And it's a complicated case in that it was ongoing for such a long time. And with so many landing traces, that alone makes it important. But also an important case because it was very well researched by a professional investigator. So a lot to learn from that case for sure. And now we move to our next case, which I call the E.T. in the cage. Yes, you heard me right. <laughs> this is quite a bizarre and unusual case. However, it does involve multiple witnesses who did not know each other. The primary witness is a good observer. She's a professional, a nurse. Police got involved in this case as well, which brings a level of credibility to it. This one took place in the summer of 1971 in Iowa City, Iowa. And I think you'll find it quite interesting and unusual. This case comes from researcher Brad Steiger, very well known, the author of many books on UFOs. And again, this involves multiple witnesses. The first witness is an anonymous nurse in her early 50s who worked at a major hospital in Iowa City. And she was driving to work around dawn, again one summer morning in 1971, and looking up saw something she couldn't believe. A small cage was suspended by a line, a rope of some kind, leading high into the sky. Now apparently she couldn't see what was holding this cage up, but it was really the cage that held her attention. She said it was egg-shaped with vertical bars, quite small, just enough to hold a full-grown person. And as she drove closer to it, she saw that, in fact, this cage was occupied. Inside of it was a humanoid figure, but not normal. It was dressed in a strange, shining, form-fitting one-piece suit. Now, it was too high up for her to see any facial features, but she could see that whoever this was, he was gazing intently downwards. She said he had a very thick chest, very thick arms and legs, much thicker than any human being. And she said while its suit was bright, the facial area was quite dark. She could see that whoever it was, he was moving around. And she did have the distinct impression that it was looking down right at her. So she drove to work shared her experiences with her co-worker and her, later her family. And her son-in-law, hearing this, uh, actually started talking about it to other people, and this led to Brad Steiger hearing about it. And Brad Steiger coordinated with one of his correspondents in the area who began an investigation, and they learned that there were, in fact, other witnesses. This investigator discovered that a newspaper delivery boy in the same area at the same time also saw apparently this same dangling cage with this weird humanoid figure inside it, provided the same description. And so did another witness, a laundry delivery man, who again described the same details. All of these witnesses were out early uh, due to their jobs and apparently saw the same exact thing. So, the main investigator actually contacted the police and learned that they had in fact received a few calls from other people reported the same thing. And they made, quote, extensive efforts to identify this man in this cage, actually calling airports, checking on any local helicopter activity, but they got no leads. They were unable to come up with any explanation as to what this was. Interestingly, the nurse herself said that she had previously been not only skeptical of UFOs, but had ridiculed the subject. Needless to say, she has changed her mind. I love it when a skeptic has an introduction to the UFO phenomena and is basically forced to change their mind. 
That's kind of what happened to me. So I feel for the primary witness, the nurse in this case. But the fact is, this is a real phenomenon. The evidence is overwhelming. And when there's a case involving multiple witnesses who don't know each other and are all reporting the same thing in the same area at the same time, I think it behooves us to take a closer look at this. And it's hard to explain this away as anything other than what it is. An amazing case. And now we move to the next case. I call this one the Silver Suited Aliens. This case got a lot of attention from UFO researchers, actually. You may have heard of it, I don't know, but it's certainly worth knowing about. This one took place in Hartford, Indiana, over a period of several hours, October 22nd through October 23rd. And what I like about this case is, again, it involves multiple witnesses and also some extraordinary physical evidence as well. Also, the ETs are very unusual and they behaved in ways that are quite weird. This is an amazing series of very well-documented strange humanoid sightings that were apparently part of the massive wave of humanoid sightings that took place in late 1973, which is often called by researchers the Year of the Humanoids because there was a lot of humanoid sightings, for whatever reason, at the end of 1973. Now, the first witness was Debbie Karn, who was driving in the Hartford, Indiana area, when she saw two silver-suited figures, each about four feet tall, she said, slowly crossing the road in front of her. And as she drove by them, she said they emitted a loud noise and kind of raised their arms which she interpreted as an attempt to frighten her. I don't think so, given what the next witnesses described, uh, which was also involved these figures raising their arms, apparently a part, of, a part of how they were just moving. Because it was only 15 minutes later, now it's around 9.45 p.m., when Mr. Dwayne Donathan and his wife Donna saw apparently these same figures in the same area, Highway 9, they gave the same sort of description, saying that there were these two figures wearing bright silver suits. The most unusual feature was that they had these sort of box-like feet, almost as if they were wearing shoe boxes. They moved in a weird, clumsy, sort of flopping manner, uh, apparently in an attempt to avoid uh, the Donathan's car. And I'll just quote Mrs. Donathan uh, the main witness, because her husband didn't see them that well. But as she says, and I quote, We were coming home from visiting my mother, and I was driving. Duane, my husband, held the baby, and we were just about a block from home. I rounded a slight curve and a small hill, and there in the road we saw what I thought might be a reflection from a farm tractor in the road. I slowed down and could see what looked like two kids, about four feet tall, moving in the road. I stopped the car approximately 30 feet distance, and with the headlights shining on them, I decided it couldn't be kids this time of night in the road with me coming at them in a car. They looked confused. They would hop in the air, their feet would come up slowly, one at a time, and their arms would flop funny. They moved slower than humans do, and their feet and arms would go up. Funny. Their feet came off the ground easily. They were a bright silver. The husband also saw them briefly, not for not as long a time as his wife, but he said it looked almost like they were dancing in the road. Both of them were impressed by the weird shape of their box-like feet. But seeing them, Mrs. Donathan screamed out, Oh my God! And she accelerated the car and swerved around them. Um, she was pretty much panicked at this point. She drove a few blocks and pulled over to let Dwayne drive. And he insisted on turning around and going back and making sure that these were not children because he wanted to give them a scolding if they were. So they returned to this area to see if they could see these beings. They didn't, but they did see some weird lights kind of moving in a snake-like pattern over a nearby cornfield. They returned home. 
Mrs. Donovan was so upset that she was kind of in shock and it came very close to calling the doctor. But she was able to calm down and they called the police. And this led to more witnesses. Because it was later that night, technically it's now October 23rd because it's just past midnight, when truck driver and gas station owner Gary Leroy Flatter heard about the Donathan sighting. Because as it turned out, his friend was a police officer and he was there when the call came in. So Gary went to investigate, he and the other officer, in separate cars. The other officer was in another area. He didn't see anything, but Gary did. He was driving one mile south of the above sighting, heading south on road 300. And he turned to the east and he saw something really unusual. He said he saw six or seven rabbits scurrying across the road as if avoiding something, followed immediately by a raccoon and then a possum. So a bunch of animals running across the road, including several cats as well. So it was clear to him that something was scaring them. They were running away from something. And looking to where they were running from, this is when he saw apparently these same two figures that the Donathans saw. These figures were now standing in this field about 75 feet away from him. He said they were glowing brightly in these silvery metallic outfits and they turned his, their backs to his headlights. And his description is the same as the other witnesses. He said they were about four feet tall, wearing tight-fitting silver suits that looked, quote, halfway between galvanized sheet metal and a mirror, so very bright. And in fact, he turned his spotlight on them which he said they did not seem to like, but the glare from their suits was so strong he couldn't get a good look at him. They didn't like it, so he turned off his spotlight. And this is when he got a really close look at him. He probably got a closer look than any other witnesses. And he also remarked on the huge square blocks that were on their feet. He said they had egg-shaped heads, and were wearing what looked like gas masks with hoses running down to their chests. And like the other witnesses, he said they moved very strangely, kind of bouncing in slow motion in the air with their arms flopping up and down, kind of like they were, quote, skipping rope. And he said they seemed to float away as if they had engines in their shoes, kind of like a, a helicopter is how he described it. And it was during this time he did hear a high-pitched sound. But, as Gary Flatter says in his own words, they just flew off in the dark, and I couldn't find them with my spotlight. I did see some r strange red trace-like streaks coming down, and that was all. So he returned the next day with Deputy Ed Townsend, Dwayne Donathan, and himself, and they found a total of seven footprints. And this is weird because these footprints were each about three-fourths of an inch deep, three inches across, with a stride of somewhere between 12 and 18 inches. But what was so weird and amazing is the ground was hard enough that they themselves, the witnesses, couldn't, were not leaving any footprints or imprints, which meant that these beings must have been of considerable weight. That is such an interesting case. I don't know what the ETs were doing in the middle of the road over and over again. But I like this case because it's got some very weird animal reaction evidence, landing traces that are very hard to explain, multiple independent witnesses of high caliber. It's a very interesting case and we know exactly where it occurred, which also I think makes it even more fascinating. And here is another case. There's always another case. <laughs> I mean, you can dismiss one, but there's another to take its place. And this one I call the E.T. in the Gravel Pit. This is a really interesting case, which took place on May 24, 1977, in Canada, actually, near Wildwood Lake. Uh, this is in St. Mary's area, Fairview of Ontario, Canada. And while there's only one witness to the actual humanoid, it does involve multiple witnesses. 
and it took place in a very unusual area in terms of this UFO and humanoid being seen in a gravel pit. There's some very interesting aspects to this case, physical evidence, a very unusual humanoid, and the main witness was able to get so close to this UFO he actually touched it, knocked on the door, so to speak. And this is what caused the ET to come out. <laughs> so a really interesting interactive case as well, as we shall see. The main witness in this case is known only as Dan. That's either his first name or a pseudonym. And he was taking a long walk near a gravel pit, not far from his home, again in Ontario, Canada, when at around 2 p.m. he felt a blast of heat. He's walking right by this gravel pit, and the heat is coming from this gravel pit. And I'll just quote Dan directly, as he says, I turned and looked into the gravel pit, and there, sitting at a 45 degree angle, was an arrowhead shaped object. I thought it was an airplane at first, and walked into the pit to get a closer look. It was very warm in the pit, and I noticed there were a couple of sticks and little plants on fire, about 15 to 20 feet from it. I also noticed that the rocks underneath the object, little gravel stones an inch or so in diameter, were actually splitting and popping like popcorn from the heat. So he's looking at this thing. He described this object as sort of wedge-shaped. He says it looked like stainless steel, but it did have a greenish tint to it. And it was resting on three supports. One was kind of cylindrical shaped, and the other, he said, looked sort of like skis. But having just recently read about an air show, this was where his mind sort of went. He thought at first that this had to be some sort of unusual plane. And he decided he was going to get a closer look. So he began to climb down into the pit itself. Now doing so, at some point, the object itself was obscured by the rocks around him. And when he got the gravel pit back in view and reached this area, he was shocked to see that this object was no longer there. It was gone. He didn't hear anything. He didn't see it. So he was absolutely mystified by its disappearance. But at this point, still assumed that it must have been some kind of plane. Though he couldn't see how a plane could possibly land there. So he exited the pit and continued his walk. As it turns out, there, there were three other gravel pits in this area. Again, this is by Wildwood Lake. And as he walked by the second one, he saw a metallic glint. And I'll just let the main witness, Dan, describe what he saw. As he says, I looked down, and sitting at exactly the same angle was the object that had been in the first pit. There was a hydraulic hum, and as it hummed, it came down to a 10 degree angle where the nose was 6 to 7 feet off the ground, and the tail was about 3 feet off the ground. The whole thing was about 50 feet long and 25 feet wide. So we actually saw this object coming in for a landing. And as soon as it landed, he said it did this weird sort of unfolding, kind of opening like a fan, and rested there for a few minutes when suddenly it rose silently upward and headed towards the other gravel pit, the third, which was about a half mile away. He did notice something very strange. As the object departed below treetop level right near him, he had the feeling that his own body weight practically tripled. So he felt this incredible heaviness, like the gravity itself had increased. So at this point, he's beginning to think something very strange is going on, but he's still sort of clinging to this airplane <laughs> explanation. But watching this object heading towards this next gravel pit, he decided to go investigate. And as Dan says, I reached the third pit and the object was sitting at the 10 degree angle again on the three skis. I watched it for a few minutes and I kept thinking, is it an airplane? I finally went down into the pit and walked up to the nose of the thing. I rapped on it. I actually banged on it. It was very smooth and sounded very solid. No boing to it at all. It was like hitting a concrete wall. So he's very much puzzled. This is clearly a craft of some kind. It's solid steel. He walked around it and then actually went underneath this thing, banging on it again. 
and then something truly incredible happened. And again, I will just quote Dan directly, as he says in his own words, I heard a clunk from behind me. I turned around to see a three-foot-wide ramp had dropped. The noise I heard was it hitting the ground. Then this little guy came out. I took one look at him, and I knew he wasn't human. He was four and a half to five feet tall and looked like the belly of a garter snake, scaly, greenish-yellow skin. He didn't have a normal mouth, but something like a snorkel. He didn't seem to have any knees. He walked straight-legged down the ramp, shifting his hips forward with each step. He was wearing a tannish suit that didn't have any seams or zippers visible, and his boots sounded very heavy, like they were weighted, and they were a shiny silver in color. So this is very interesting. We see the short humanoid again. Often people describe these ETs as not bending their knees, moving in a kind of clunky fashion. And again, he saw this sort of scaly-looking skin. At this point, the beings stared right at him, and they locked gazes for a good five seconds, he says, which is a long time to stare at an ET. And as Dan says, and I quote, I've never had such a shock in all my life. He was in full view and walking towards me when I shouted, My God! I jumped up, hitting my head on the bottom of the object, and ran just as fast as I could. I hid in the bushes by the side of the pit and watched the thing take off. It flew low over the field by the gravel pit. It would rise up out of sight, then it would fall back down again, straight up, straight down, like a yo-yo. And all this time there was absolutely no sound. Now at this point, he says he kind of felt a sense of timelessness. He lost sense of time. He was watching this object moving back and forth over the field. And the next thing he knows, he's walking back into his father-in-law's house. And he's late for dinner. So this is clearly, or certainly very possibly, a case of missing time. But it was later that same evening, at around 7.15 p.m., he was driving with his wife's grandmother very close to this area near Fairview when it was his grandmother who pointed out a strange object at treetop level, 30 feet high and about 50 feet off to the side of the road. And she said to Dan, do you see what I see up there in the tree? And Dan said, yes, that's a flying saucer. In fact, he recognized it as the same thing he had seen earlier that day. His grandmother said, but they can't be real. And Dan said, well, is that real? And she said, yes. <laughs> Dan said, well, then we are looking at a flying saucer. So at this point, he stops the car and walks closer up to it. And he saw the humanoid again. As he says in his own words, I saw this little bulbous head fellow looking out the trap door at me. I had the feeling that my grandmother wasn't supposed to be with me. I thought of this, turned and looked at her in the car, and when I turned back, the thing was gone. I just got back in the car, and we drove home. So there you go. An amazing case of a UFO landing, a humanoid coming out, interaction between the ET and the witness, physical evidence as well, possibly missing time, so this could be more than just a simple sighting uh, with follow-up witnesses seeing UFOs in the area at the same time. So a lot to like about this case. I think one of the takeaways is the fact that this craft did land in a gravel pit. And not just once, but four different gravel pits. There are a lot of cases of UFOs hovering and landing at mines and sometimes affecting them physically. So that could be why the ET was there. Either way, it's an amazing case, important on a lot of levels. And that's why I wanted to include it in this collection. And now let's move to another case. And this one I call Assaulted by Aliens. And when I say that, I don't mean, mean physically attacked. But apparently they tried to steal something from the main witness. And he wasn't having it. 
So a very interesting interaction between the very unusual humanoids and the quite frightened witness. This took place on November 24, 1978, in a small town of Gallio. This is near Vicenza, Italy. And it's a really interesting case because while there is only one witness to the actual humanoid, there's a bunch of witnesses who described seeing UFOs in the sky at that time in that area. And not only that, described the craft with the same details that the witness described, and he did not know about them. Also interesting because there's not only landing trace evidence, but some other very interesting physical evidence. It was a cold but sunny afternoon, November 24, 1978, and it was actually just before noon when Angelo D'Ambrose, age 61, retired, was out gathering firewood near his home in the little town of Gallio. And he had just chopped up a branch with his bill hook. This is a sawing tool with a curved blade. And this is when he noticed two very strange humanoids who were very, very close to him, only about three feet away. And they were looking right at him. And boy, were they weird looking. He said both were very short, about three feet tall, though one was slightly taller. They were both very thin, with tight yellow skin, long, elongated, pear-shaped heads, huge pointed ears, sunken white eyes, a large protruding nose, and wide mouths with what looked like fangs on the top of their mouths, two fangs. He said they had huge hands and feet with what looked like claws or nails. They were wearing dark skin, tight overalls, which covered only their torso and part of their arms and legs, leaving their hands and feet bare and their head. But most amazing is they were floating about one and a half feet above the ground. Now, when he first noticed them, they were side by side. But immediately, one of them, the shorter one, began to glide swiftly from side to side. This really freaked Angelo out. He was absolutely terrified and he shouted out for help at the top of his voice and he then began asking them who they were and what they wanted. Now one of the beings did respond but Angelo says he was not able to understand them and this is when his attention was suddenly drawn to the one that was slightly taller and was kind of staying still because this taller one suddenly lunged forward reached out and tried to grab Angelo's bill hook. Now, Angelo had it in his hand at the time. It had a leather handle, and he held tightly and refused to let the creature have it. This being was trying to grab it by the dull end. Now, despite this and that Angelo was still holding on, this figure tried again to grab the bill hook again by the handle. And when it did this, Angelo felt this strange electrical discharge, assumingly coming from the being. But he still held tight to his bill hook, and this creature was determined. This ET tried a third time to take his bill hook, this time using both its hands and considerable strength. But Angelo said he was absolutely terrified. His adrenaline was pumping, and he held tightly. But when this being grabbed the bill hook, he could really feel this strong electrical discharge, not only in his hands, but running up from his hands all the way up to his arm. And seeing that this strange being was determined to take his bill hook, Angelo wasn't having it. He reached down, grabbed one of the branches he had just cut, and made ready to strike this creature. Now, apparently realizing that Angelo was not going to give up his possessions willingly and that he now represented a danger to them, perhaps, these creatures fled. Angelo, recovering from shock and now armed with his stick and knife, actually took after them as they ran down along this narrow mule path. He said they moved very fast, faster than human. He quickly lost sight of them. But he ran after them anyway, continuing his search, and a short while later came upon this strange craft in a field. Uh, 
at this point it was about 60 to 65 feet away and appeared to be a classic flying saucer. He said the object was on the ground itself. It had four landing legs. He estimates it was about 12 feet wide, 6 feet high, clearly metallic with a dome on top. And it's interesting because it, the colors of this thing, the upper part was bright red. There was a white band which ran around the circumference and the bottom half was blue. So red, white, and blue. The legs of the craft itself looked kind of aluminum gray, he said. Now he no sooner sees this thing when he sees that there's a door in it and it's closing and he got a brief glimpse of one of the arms of these beings uh, closing the door from the inside. And it was seconds later that this craft took off in perfect silence at a diagonal angle and it emitted a burst of red flame and boom was gone in seconds. So he was very much shocked by this encounter. He immediately went home, kept turning over and over the events that just happened, skipped his lunch, finally decided to tell his son-in-law, Luciano Munari. So the next day, Luciano returned to the scene with another person and found apparently where this object had landed because there was a circular landing spot about 10 to 11 feet wide of blackened vegetation. This vegetation was not only blackened, it was also flattened and rotated in a counterclockwise pattern. Inside the circle, Luciano found two U-shaped depressions less than a foot wide. Uh, while the witness, Angelo, did describe four landing legs, the other side of the circle had hard stones on the ground, so they didn't find any depressions there. But they did find that some of the bushes next to this area looked as though they had been uprooted. Now there was more evidence. An examination of the bill hook where the being had grabbed it showed what looked like fingerprints or unusual discoloring. The blade kind of turned red. So this was brought in for examination, but it turned out to cost too much money and it was never analyzed in any professional way. But later, researchers, including the main researcher, Antonio Chiomiento, did find other witnesses, and not just one or two, a bunch of them. One of them was Maria Borsato Casausa, who at around 1215, pretty much exactly when Angelo said that this craft took off, she saw a craft departing the area. And she described it very much as he did, as metallic, with a dark lower half and the upper half being intense orange-red. Same time, same area, another witness, a bus driver by the name of Signor Busa, said he saw an oval, bright red-orange object moving around at treetop level. And a passenger in his vehicle also saw it. Finally, Giovanni Pertil and his family watched apparently the same object moving around, and he actually managed to capture it on film. Meanwhile, the local newspaper office said that they received several calls from people reporting a UFO, but they refused to give their names. So yeah, a lot of witnesses. What a weird case that is. Very unusual looking humanoids. Also very unusual acting humanoids. You have to hand it to the witness in that case for not letting them take his cutting tool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, very well verified in terms of it being researched by professional investigators with landing traces, other physical evidence, multiple witnesses all over the area seeing craft at that time. Definitely an important case. And here's another one. This one I call... A warning for all humanity. When people get messages from ETs, it's often some kind of warning. And that's absolutely true in this very interesting case, which occurred on February 16, 1980, in Edinburgh, Scotland. This is one of only two single witness cases in this collection. 
But it's an extensive case because this witness was having some very unusual experiences prior to his face-to-face -face encounter with three humanoids who had a very important message, not only for him, but apparently for all humanity. This case was investigated by researcher Stephen Burnett and involves a witness known only as D.L. So he's anonymous. He's a 39-year-old truck driver, married with two children, and it was in mid-1979 that he began to have some strange experiences. He kept hearing voices in his head calling his name. And it happened enough times and concerned him enough that he finally went to his doctor, who tried to treat him, but to no effect. These voices continued. So he stopped going to the doctor and was just trying to figure out what was going on. And then it was late on the evening of February 15, 1980, that he went to a bar, a pub, had a few drinks. Then he went to a friend's house and had a few more drinks with his friend. And it was around 1 a.m., now technically February 16th. And his friend's father actually drove him home to his flat in Edinburgh. And Mr. D.L. went inside, and this is when strange things began to happen. For some reason, he couldn't explain to researchers. He felt compelled to go outside. And going outside and looking at the field next to his building, he saw a bright beam of light shining down on the ground. And looking up, he saw it was coming from a dark oval shape. And so he's looking at it, studying it, trying to figure out what the heck it is, when suddenly he found himself engulfed in a, quote, light tube. He said it surrounded him completely and rendered him unable to move. He said it felt quite warm because it was cool outside. He felt strangely calm. He said he could smell an odor like burning matches. And then suddenly, without warning, stepping towards him, he saw three strange figures. Two of these figures stayed back, but one approached, signaling to the other two to remain behind. And Mr. D.L. says that these three figures were about five and a half feet tall, of average build, but certainly looked strange because they were wearing a dark, metallic, silver, one-piece suit. And this covered their faces as well, sort of a brown visor. So their hands were covered by a material that was darker than the rest of this suit. He also noticed that the area under their shoulders kind of bulged in an unusual way. And it was at this point that he heard the, quote, alien start talking to him in a voice that he described as, quote, like mixed foreign tongues. So he didn't understand what they were saying, and he's trying to listen, and this is when he realized that this communication was not actually audible, but was telepathic, or as he says, in the mind. And this is when he did understand what they were saying. Uh, the ET said that he had a message that he wished the witness to communicate to others. And this ET said, and I quote, This was our planet before yours and we will not allow you to destroy it. If you try, we will shudder the earth. Only the innocent will survive. So that's a pretty powerful message, but at this point, the figures immediately vanished, the tube of light was gone, the object was gone, D.L. himself felt quite weak and dizzy. He rushed back inside and called the police. The police did not believe him, accused him of being drunk, uh, yeah, he was a little tipsy, uh, but the witness insists that this was a real event and eventually contacted researchers. Uh, researcher Stephen Burnett did call the police, who confirmed that Mr. D.L. did in fact call, but the investigation really went no further than that. So it's unfortunate that case wasn't further investigated, but apparently the witness had had enough and didn't want to talk about it anymore, which is understandable. This is a lot for people to deal with. He's married with kids, you know, and dealing with this has probably caused a lot of stress, but certainly an interesting case. And yeah, it was investigated by a professional researcher who did verify that the police were contacted as well. And I think it's important because it shows this very common message that ETs keep giving people over and over again. Hopefully one day we will listen. 
And now we move to the next case, which is really quite unusual. <laughs> I call this one the Peeping Tom E.T. There are quite a few cases of E.T.'s looking in people's windows. This one takes that to a whole new level. This occurred on March, or in March through July of 1982 in a very small town, Hespeler, Canada. We know exactly where this case took place. And it's super interesting because it does involve multiple witnesses. Although only one witness saw the humanoid, she saw it over and over again. And it was behaving, as we shall see, in a very unusual way. But yeah, multiple witnesses to UFO activity in that area at that time, which of course brings more credibility to the case. The main witness in this case is known only as Mary. And again, she lived in a little town called Hespeler along River Road. This is a short little road pictured here. It's like less than a mile long. So we know approximately where this case took place. And it was around 11 p.m. one evening in early March 1982, and Mary was taking a bath. And looking up at the window in the bathroom, which had frosted glass and no curtains, she distinctly saw the shape of a head looking at her through the window. But it vanished so quickly that she thought perhaps she had imagined it. But still, it scared her. And it was two nights later, again at 11 p.m., the same thing happened. She was taking her bath as she usually did, and she saw the shape of a head right up against the window. As soon as she looked at it, it quickly disappeared. And again, she wondered, could she possibly be imagining this? But if so, why now when she had never seen anything like this before? Why twice? So she was frightened. She closed the shower door, continued her bath. And it was one week later, she was taking her bath again at 11 p.m., looked up, and this time saw two heads. And this time they were right up against the window, apparently trying to look inside through the frosted glass. And this time she knew she wasn't imagining things. She saw them plainly. In fact, she saw some good detail. According to Mary, the head was normal in size, but had a silver helmet on top. She couldn't see any facial features, but she did see that these heads had very pointed chins, and the heads themselves seemed to be glowing with light. Now this window is quite high, which meant that if these beings were standing, they would have to be at least six and a half feet tall, unless they're floating, which is certainly possible. So while this grass was, glass was frosted, it's still transparent, and investigators went to the area and sort of reenacted the incident and learned that the shape of a person could be easily seen through the frosted glass. But after this third incident, Mary refused to take her bath until midnight when her husband came home from work. But events were still in progress. It was three weeks later, in March 1982, Mary was having trouble sleeping. So around 1.30 a.m., she went to get a glass of water, and looking out the backyard window, she saw a pulsating, cone-shaped object hovering and then landed, apparently, on the ground beside a maple tree. She said this object was yellow on top, orange in the center, and dark orange on bottom, but all the colors were kind of bleeding and morphing into each other. And it was pretty large. She estimates that it was 16 feet high, 12 feet wide, and about 600 feet away, which is pretty close. So she watches this for a few minutes and decides she's going to go get the binoculars and is running around the house trying to find them, couldn't find them. So at this point, she wanted to wake up her husband, but felt this weird numbness. She says it was almost as though an invisible force was preventing her from waking up her husband. So she's watching this object again, then made another attempt to find the binoculars. She wanted to wake up her son, but again felt like she couldn't do it, almost as if she was compelled not to. And when she returned to the window, the object was gone. She watched it, she estimates, for about 20 minutes. She also says that during the time of this sighting, her dog was, quote, highly agitated. 
while it was not barking its ears were perked up and it apparently sensed that something was going on outside unfortunately she did not look to see if there were any markings on the lawn for some time apparently when they finally did look there was nothing there but the events were still in progress because it was about four months later that mary and her daughter ordered a pizza and it was around 10 30 p.m and they decided to look out the front window to see if the pizza man had arrived. And instead, they saw something else. Four bright, glowing objects zigzagging in the sky. So this time, they found the binoculars, and through the binoculars saw that these objects were in fact gray disks with red, white, and blue lights. So the pizza man arrived, and all of them stood on the front porch and watched these UFOs. As it turned out, just a few miles away, Mary's son-in-law was also watching these objects. So Mary, her daughter, and the pizza man watched these objects for about a half an hour, apparently became bored, and went back inside while these objects were still out there. I think you'll agree that's a very unusual case. Hard to say why the E.T. was so particularly interested in the main witness. She doesn't report any other encounters. Um, I don't know if there's been any follow-up or not, so maybe she did have further encounters. I don't know. But certainly interesting because the UFOs came back and put on a clear display for the witness, for her family, for the pizza man as well, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And I can't imagine seeing a UFO for you know a half an hour and then getting bored with it and walking back inside. Though I can tell you, I've certainly heard that sort of thing from other witnesses. So, I don't know. And now we get to the final case of this little collection. And I call this one, They Weren't Human. Again, a direct quote from the main witness. Although there are actually multiple witnesses in this case. It's a pretty unusual and interesting case. What I like about this one is it does involve a craft landing, humanoids coming out. The witness was able to get quite close to them and saw them engaging in a behavior which is something we see quite a bit with UFO occupants. I also like this case because it's fairly recent. This occurred on July 21st, 2001 over the very small town of Geneva, Pennsylvania. So again, this case took place in the very small town of Geneva, which is about 10 miles south of Meadville. And as the witness says, I wish to remain anonymous. At the time of this incident, July 21st, 2001, he was about 11 years old. It was 11 p.m., a warm summer night, and the witness, who I'll call Jeff, that's a pseudonym, he was at his grandmother's house with four of his cousins and they were all playing hide-and-seek in a 10-acre field next to the farm and bordering on a thick forest. And they were very near the forest line when the incident happened. And as Jeff says in his own words, the pitch black forest lit up as if it was daytime, a beautiful blue light bright enough to fill a football stadium. It looked like the sun had landed in the woods. What we first noticed when the light appeared was how it did not dim slowly into the darkness. It abruptly stopped at each side of the property as if there was a physical wall of darkness. So this is very interesting, this sort of coherent light, unusual lights that are often reported in UFO cases. Now, the children were quite spread out at this time, and as it turned out, Jeff was closest to this light. And knowing the woods like the back of our hands, he says, he was curious and unafraid and decided to go investigate, because he's assuming that some people were riding all-terrain vehicles in the forest. But as he approached, he soon realized how wrong he was. As he says, as I ran closer to the object, I realized it was not what I had thought. So it was very strange. You could see as he got close and he approached within 100 feet and realized that this was in fact a UFO. As Jeff says in his own words, it was too hard to look at, almost like trying to stare at the sun. 
The blue orb was a little larger than a Volkswagen Beetle car, and I saw two entities that were running around grabbing objects off the ground. I saw one of them grab a box sitting next to a tree, then dive into the orb via a door that lifted vertically, not horizontally. The second being was about to hop into the same door when it stopped. It stood there for a few moments and looked at me. The other entity hopped back out of the orb and began to stare at me as well. I couldn't make out the details of what they looked like because the craft was too bright. I could see their silhouettes. They had abnormally large heads, and I could tell they were not wearing clothing or shoes. So this area is pretty remote. It's just forest out there. There's a little bit of a swamp. But Jeff had the distinct impression that they were taking samples of the vegetation and soil, only stopping when he, they saw that he was approaching them. So he had apparently interrupted them in whatever they were doing. And as Jeff says in his own words, At this moment, I could hear my cousins screaming my name from the field. They were begging me to run. My self-preservation kicked in. I knew they weren't human, and I was in danger of being abducted. So I ran as fast as I could out of the woods, past my family, and straight towards the house to tell the adults to look outside. We made it halfway through the field when the woods went black again. So yeah, many cases where UFOs land, ETs come out and start collecting plants and rocks and vegetation and what have you, which just goes to show they're pretty interested in all things Earth whether it's the geology or the flora and fauna. So I think that's an interesting and important takeaway from this case, which again is quite recent. I also like it because it does involve multiple witnesses, and it appears to be your standard grays, judging from the sort of stick figure sketch <laughs> provided by the witness. That's certainly an interesting and important case. All right, well, that's our show for today. Ten cases coming from all over the world, all involving pretty extensive interactions between extraterrestrials and humans over quite a long period of time, decades, many involving multiple witnesses, um, some who don't know each other, which always, again, adds credibility to each of these cases and lots of evidence. We see some really extraordinary evidence in terms of the electromagnetic effects, watches stopping, cars going out, headlights failing, these sort of things, but also landing traces of all kinds, whether it's apples being partially eaten or burned circles on an Iowa farm or asphalt getting dents in it or footprints in a field that are far deeper than a normal human would make. Interesting landing trace cases for sure. Animal evidence as well. Medical effects. And certainly profound psychic and spiritual effects. Because following these encounters, many of these witnesses <laughs> were afraid to go outside or had other really profound emotional, mental, spiritual, psychic effects following their encounters. So yeah, as I always like to say, there's a lot to learn from extraterrestrial encounters, not only about the ETs, but about ourselves. And if there's any takeaway that I wish people would take from cases like these, is that this is actually happening. There are so many cases. I honestly believe that anyone who takes an objective look at the evidence that's out there can only come away convinced. I think it's time we just simply accept that, stop trying to prove this phenomenon. It's been proven over and over again. Disclosure has, in effect, already happened. The evidence is there. The ETs have certainly done their part to provide it. So, that's it for today. I hope you learned something. hope you found it at least entertaining. I really want to thank you once again for watching. It's always appreciated. And until next time, Keep searching for the truth, keep asking those questions, and most important of all, keep having fun. Bye for now.